one sunny July morning in 2014, I noticed a swarm of bees were making a home in my garage wall in downtown Santa Barbara. I know bees don't look like puppies or kittens, but I was worried these poor little creatures would be exterminated if my landlord found them there. I grew up on a farm with bees. My grandfather and father were both beekeepers, so I called Dad, who's now a health and safety consultant. Hey, Dad, what do you think about urban beekeeping? <laughs> it's a terrible idea, son. Too risky. You are the last person who should be keeping bees. <laughs> what? Now I'm definitely keeping the bees. My friend John and I borrowed a couple of bee suits and proceeded to dismantle the garage and relocate the bees into a beehive I'd also borrowed and balanced on a ladder. 20,000 stinging insects and a ladder. What could possibly go wrong? <laughs> From the outside, they looked okay, but these bees were going to die. The queen was long gone. These bees were doomed to become part of the 30% of hives that died out that year and have every year since 2006. When something or someone is suddenly in trouble, you pay close attention. I felt that way when my grandfather was in trouble. About 15 years ago, my grandfather, I call him Pa, learned there was something wrong with his heart and he needed a valve replacement. They opened him up in surgery and had complications. He needed an emergency triple bypass as well. Pa was at the limits of life support. His heart stopped beating. And he recovered. What I learned is that Pa now checks his heart rate and vitals almost every day. And by paying close attention, he can proactively address issues before they become severe. Paying attention has transformed healthcare. We need to pay more attention to the bees. When my friend Paul, a wise beekeeper of 40 plus years, asked me to count flying bees so he could get a sense of beehive health, I had an epiphany. Could monitoring bee flight activity be just like proactively monitoring Pa's heart? Could paying more attention to the bees help us save them? I have a somewhat unique background and experience in healthcare as a medical robotics engineer. I get to help doctors treat patients remotely through robots. So I started trying to make a robotic assistant for beekeepers. <laughs> as you do. <laughs> what a glamorous robot. <laughs> I needed to teach the robot how to see bees. In the real world, bees live outside. This meant putting a laptop in a bucket, pointed at a beehive. Even more glamorous. <laughs> I taught Bucket Bot how to see and count bees. It measures the number of flying bees in front of the hive as bees per second. The bot was able to watch the beehive all day, every day, and we graphed the data. The robot's computer vision captured something special. We discovered this bee flight activity pattern. You can see there's a giant spike. No one had noticed this before. Nobody had measured it before. It's the collective flight activity pattern of the beehive superorganism. And it turns out every healthy hive has this spike regularly. This is the heartbeat of a beehive. Using data and computer vision is wildly different from how we check bee health today. Traditionally, beekeepers open our hives every few weeks. We aim to see evidence of a healthy queen, how well the colony is managing pests and disease, and if the bees have enough food. When looking inside a beehive, I feel like I'm a guest in nature's cathedral. The colors of pollen reflect the variety of local flowers the bees have been visiting. It reminds me of stained glass. Bees have fermented pollen to make bee bread for millions of years. Bee bread is more nutritious than pollen alone. 
Not bad for a creature with a brain the size of a sesame seed. <laughs> Bees need flowers to get that protein-rich pollen. What you might see is weeds on your lawn. Bees call family dinner. <laughs> There are bee killers inside the hive too. The varroa mite to bees is the equivalent of a blood-sucking tick, the size of a backpack to us. Imagine having a disease-spreading parasite attached to you for your entire life. Sounds like a B-grade horror movie. <laughs> bees use propolis to seal gaps in the hive. It's like the skin of the colony superorganism, and we break it every time we open them up. We're as gentle as possible, but the process is like a minor surgery. The bees won't get back to normal for a couple of days. We wouldn't want to operate on par every day. What's shocking is that many beekeepers I've spoken to would tell me they'd open a hive, find it to be healthy, then two or three weeks later, come back and find the hive had died. What happened in that in-between time? Are even beekeepers not paying enough attention to the bees? We need bees. Bees have a crucial role in pollination for many plants. If it has a flower, it probably depends on a pollinator. I'm talking about apples, tomatoes, squash, almonds, peppers, pumpkins. It turns out that one in three bites of the food we eat depends on bees. The food bees don't pollinate directly, like the grapes to make a glass of your favorite wine. Depend on the nitrogen plants pollinated by bees help put into the soil. Cheers, bees. So let's come back to that activity pattern that looks like a heartbeat. The orientation activity is the baby bees flying in front of the hive, learning where they live. They make these figure eight flight patterns, seeing the hive from different angles, so they can remember how to find home. The spike is because most of the baby bees come out around the same time each day. It's like a school lunchtime of bees. We started to monitor beehives in our own community and around the world. We found a pattern for when a strong beehive is robbing a weak beehive. We found the pattern for swarming was three times as big of a spike as that orientation activity. We began to understand that hives without the heartbeat activity were telling us they were in trouble. In one colony where the activity and heartbeat were flatlining, we found no sign of a queen. So we transplanted eggs from another healthy hive, a little like Pi's valve replacement. The bees raised a new queen, and the colony recovered. We can save an individual colony with the help of monitoring technology. Bees open the door to a wider perspective. The bees' flight makes me feel connected to every single person with a garden within a three-mile radius in my community. And the actions of every other person within a three-mile radius are connected to the bees' well-being, for better or worse. But bees aren't just tireless pollinators important for our food. Bees are an indicator species for what's going on in our environment. Bees are a vital sign. When so many individual colonies are dying, it means that something is fundamentally wrong. And what's going wrong is within a three-mile radius. Of each of us. In a resilient environment, native bees happily do the pollination. Honeybees are just extra help. But recently, hundreds of our native bee species have gone extinct, or are at severe risk of extinction. All of our bees are in trouble. So, what does it even mean to save the bees? If we keep honeybees alive on life support, we've just got another feedlot animal. We can save them just as we've saved cows, pigs, and chickens. As chemicals created to kill continue to accumulate in our soils and pollute our waterways, the pressure on diversity increases. Bigger picture, we risk systemic failures of our food and ecosystems. And we won't have a Plan B. <laughs> There are four horsemen of our bee apocalypse: pesticides, p 
pathogens, pests, and poor nutrition. Pesticides and poor nutrition are linked to monoculture farming, but they're also linked to our own backyard. If you have a lawn or garden and you're using a pesticide or herbicide to keep it perfect, consider this. The things that are killing the bees are in direct contact with other things you care about, your dog, your cat, and even your kids. We need a shift in perspective. Why teach your kids that bugs and bees are yucky or to be feared? They're around when the environment is healthy. When you buy organic food a little bit nibbled by a bug, it means it hasn't been drenched in poison. You could thank the bug for confirming the food is safe to eat. <laughs> good enough for bugs, good enough for bees, good enough for me. Progress is being made as modern farmers reintegrate old-school sustainable practices like crop rotation, organic principles, and integrated pest management. The rest of us can help too by creating bee sanctuaries in our cities. What does that look like? It looks like a meadow of native flowers in your front yard rather than a lawn. It looks like thousands of ladybugs to protect your orange tree rather than spraying poisons. It looks like the kind of world that most of us want to live in and want our children to inherit. I see our future in monitoring bee health. We've measured the heartbeat of a beehive, and bees are a vital indicator for our environment. Next time you see a bee, pay attention to her. Ask yourself if your choices at the grocery store and in your own backyard are supportive of a better future for both you and the bees. Let's pay attention to our environment and observe its vitals. We must pay more attention to the bees and remind yourself, healthy bee, healthy me. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> Thank you.